after completing the uh, centrals and the laterals, we are now ready to deal with the bulkiest tooth that is seen in the oral cavity, uh, especially in the anterior region, the maxillary canines. So, the maxillary canine is denoted by the number 3. Yes, so the canine replaces the deciduous maxillary canine and it is located as the third tooth that is away from the midline. So, the maxillary canine is denoted by the number 3. If you look at its neighbors, it is bounded mesially by the maxillary central incisors and it is bound distally by the maxillary first premolars. So, the canine is bounded mesially which means towards the midline by the maxillary cent uh, lateral incisors and it is bound to distally at the maxillary uh, first premolar. So, according to the numbers, let me remind you the maxillary uh, canines are 1, 3 and 2, 3. In the universal system, the maxillary right canine is number 6 and the left canine is number 11. So, number 6 and number 11 according to the universal system of classification and 1, 3 and 2, 3 with respect to the FDI system of classification. If you look at the general form of the tooth, you will understand that it is roughly pentagonal in shape. Pentagonal, five sides. It is usually five sided or pentagonal in shape. And the main function of the canine is for tearing as well as piercing for mastication. Tearing and piercing. The canine is also called the cornerstone of the mouth because the canine is a bulky tooth and this bulk is reflected onto the lip which gives the lip a much more fuller appearance. In case of aesthetic or reconstructive surgery, if you are supposed to give a man bulk, you can always do that by increasing the heft of the canine. This will give a much more heft to the upper lip as well. Therefore, canines are called the cornerstones of the mouth. So, you have currently instead of an incisal edge, you are going to start seeing a new thing and that is called the cusp. You have seen a cusp and the cusp is a sharp tip. And this sharp tip is what enables us to bite and tear food, tear thick vegetables and meat. Therefore, canines are derived from the term carnivores. Yes, so we are able to eat thick stuff and thick meat and we can tear it easily because of the presence of canine. In aesthetic methods, it gives us the illusion of strength. Therefore, a more prominent canine roughly translate aesthetically to a much more strong personality inducing individual. When compared with the maxillary central incisor, the length of the crown is almost the same. Mesiodistally, the canine because it narrows down is going to have a lesser mesiodistal width when compared to the central incisor, which means that the mesiodistal width over here will be lesser when compared to the central incisor. Labiolingually, the crown will be much more wider because of the heft. Labiolingually, it will be much more wider. In the lingual aspect, the cingulum will show a much greater development because it has to ha add the chunk to the bulk of the tooth. The middle lobe of the canine will be much, much more better developed because the middle of the tooth is supposed to give strength. It is through this that the long axis passes and therefore any sort of force transmission must go through the middle lobe of the tooth. Therefore, the middle portion of the canine will be increasingly well developed. Now that we have understood almost all the general aspects of the tooth, we are now ready to go to the developmental table. 
the initiation of calcification will take place at about 4 to 5 months so at 4 to 5 months you have the initiation of calcification 4 to 5 months after the initial initiation of calcification we now go on to the completion of the enamel and the enamel will be completed in 6 to 7 years of age after completion we will now erupt and the eruption will take place at 11 to 12 years of age following which root completion will occur and that occurs at 13 to 15 years of age so root completion occurs at 13 to 15 years of age therefore initiation of calcification is at four to five uh, months the enamel is completed at six to seven years the eruption is completed at 11 to 12 years and finally the completion of the root occurs at 13 to 15 years now that we have completed the developmental table let's go to each aspect of the crown and the root on a vertical axis the first one being the labial aspect when we explore the labial aspect there are certain general considerations that we need to go through first the labial surface is going to be convex in all directions yes so it is convex in all directions and the convexity is much more pronounced mesiodistally therefore in the mesiodistal area the convexity is much more pronounced so it is going to appear much more bulky in the sides therefore the convexity is much more pronounced in the mesiodistal aspect coming to the general outline of the tooth the general outline i told you earlier is going to be pentagonal there are going to be five sides so you can see a pentagonal formation of the crown coming to the mesial outline the mesial outline the mesial outline is going to be much more convex mesial outline will be much more convex in all directions and you will see a rounded mesio incisal angle you will see a rounded mesio incisal angle the distal margin is also going to be slightly convex but at the region of the cervical you will see a slight concavity that is present then you will also see a much more rounded disto incisal angle you are seeing a much more rounded disto incisal angle therefore to repeat you are going to see a rounded convex a round convex mesial margin with a mesial contact area that is present over there with a rounded mesio incisal angle yes you are going to see a slight concavity that is present on the distal margin which is present over here then you have a convexity that is at the level of the incisal third and you will see a rounded disto incisal angle over here if you recognize one important point is that there is a slope that comes towards the cusp the one in green is the disto incisal slope and the one in blue is the mesio incisal slope and for the first time you will see that there is a variation in the length of the slopes the disto incisal slope is much greater than the mesio incisal slope and both of these have come together in a point sort of surface which is called a sharp cusp now if and only if there is a functional attrition or wear and tear the cusp will become flat but usually the canines are going to be well rounded with the distal slope much larger than the mesial slope ending up in a sharp cusp tip the next thing we have to talk about is the incisal margin the incisal margin has been explained just now remember you have the mesio incisal slope over here 
and the disto incisal slope over here the disto incisal slope is the larger one and ends up in a cusp tip yes the cervical outline is much evenly curved towards the root much evenly curved towards the root there is another consideration that we have to see over here in the middle a labial ridge transcends along the center of the crown so this is the labial ridge that is present at the level of the center of the crown and this corresponds to the middle lobe the development of the middle lobe is very important the development of the middle lobe is what gives heft and texture to the canine so now that the ridge is present it is much more prominent in a inciso cervical direction it is much more prominent in a inciso cervical direction this again represents the greater area of development of the middle lobe now that you are familiar with the labial ridge we shall now come towards the concavities that are present separating the labial ridge are two concavities that are faint that are present on either side on the mesial side you have the mesiolabial concavity on the distal side you have the distolabial concavity these represent the mesiolabial developmental depressions and the distolabial developmental depressions they are present on your tooth ever since they erupt in the oral cavity and they may wear and tear off revealing a very smooth labial surface with the labial ridge to add heft to the tooth as in incisors you can also see some imbrication lines that are present there as well therefore in the canine the considerations are number one the labial ridge which runs in an inciso cervical direction on either side flanking it are the mesiolabial developmental depression which is a concavity and a distolabial developmental depression which is the other concavity at the level of the cj you will also see imbrication lines now that the labial aspect is done with we come to the lingual aspect the lingual aspect is very easy to remember especially in three cases the mesial distal and incisal are exactly the same as that of the labial surface we are going to see the differences right now the first difference will be at the cervical outline here it is not a symmetrical curve it curves asymmetrically towards the apex and it will converge slightly towards the lingual there is a offset that goes towards the distal surface because of this convergence if you want to appreciate the offset i'm going to draw a line passing through the long axis of the tooth at that portion you will be able to appreciate that the apex has been offset towards the distal yes the uh, aspect that the cej is uh, is offset towards the distal is very very important the other convergences are the mesial and distal surfaces will always converge towards each other they will always converge towards each other if you notice the cingulum over here you will appreciate that the cingulum is an extremely bulky object the cingulum is an extremely bulky object and there is a normal lingual ridge that is extending over here and at the center of the lingual ridge you will find the lingual pit you will find the lingual then along with it you will also find two fossae flanking on either side you have the mesiolingual fossa and the distolingual fossa and this is what somehow 
represents the cingulum area of the canine. So you have the mesolingual fossa and the distolingual fossa. So in review of the lingual aspect, we have the borders that are mesial and distal are exactly similar to that of the labial view. The cusp tip is also similar to that of the labial view. The first difference will happen at the cemento enamel junction and the cemento enamel junction will be offset towards the distal. The cingulum is much more bulky and the bulky cingulum will end up in a lingual pit and then you are also going to see a lingual developmental groove that passes downwards that is towards the incisal. Planking this groove are two fossae and the fossae are the mesolingual fossa and the distolingual fossa and they are concavities. The lingual height of contour will be at the level of the cervical third. This is the lingual aspect of the canine. Coming to the mesial aspect of the canine, in the general consideration, you will notice that it is convex all over. It is convex all over and it is wider labiolingually than mesiodistally. It is wider labiolingually than mesiodistally. If you see the outline of the tooth, you will appreciate that the outline is triangular. The outline is triangular. So, let us look at the labial outline. Let us look at the labial outline right now. So, it is convex inciso cervically and it, the crest of curvature is always going to be at the cervical third. It is convex in, in size of cervically and the crest of curvature will be greatest at the cervical third. The lingual outline is going to be slightly concave and it will be convex at the level of the cingular area, but it is not as pronounced as the maxillary central incisor. The height of contour again will be at the cervical third. The incisal edge is going to be very thick. The incisal edge is going to be very thick and you will see that it slopes downward just like the central and the lateral. In other consideration, the contact point will be at the junction of the uh, incisal and the middle third. It will be at the junction of the incisal and the middle third. Coming towards the distal aspect, the distal surface generally exhibits a much smaller area than the mesial surface because of the relatively shorter labial and the lingual margin. See, compared to that, you have a relatively short labial and lingual outline. The contact is going to be much more occlusal. The contact is going to be much more occlusal and circular. Sometimes a concavity can also be found on the cervical half. A concavity can also be sometimes found on the cervical half. And the height of contour will be at a cervical level of the tooth. The height of contour will be at the cervical level of the tooth. Everything else is similar to the mesial aspect. Coming to the incisal aspect, here is where you find the greatest amount of change in terms of symmetry. Yes, the maxillary canine on the labial as well as the lingual is going to be convex. But if you notice the shape of the tooth, it's a little skewed. Why? Because it has a asymmetrical diamond shape. You have a asymmetrical diamond shape. Yes, the mesial half is going to be thicker. The mesial half will be much more thicker than the distal half. The mesial half is much more thicker than the distal half. The distal portion is considerably thin when compared to the mesial because of the longer length of the labial surface. The greatest development will be seen in the middle portion because of the presence of the 
labial lobe because of the presence of the middle lobe that is over there. Sometimes in the distal area, you are going to see a slight concavity. In the distal area, you are going to see a slight concavity. Because of this, because of this, you will also notice that if a line is drawn, the skew of the cingulum, the skew of the cingulum will be towards the distal surface. The cingulum is very, very skewed, especially to the distal surface because of the presence of that particular concavity. So, here the crown is going to be generally convex on both labial and lingual. The cusp tip is going to be sharp. It is going to be an asymmetrical diamond pattern. The mesial half is going to be thicker. The distal half is going to be thinner. There is going to be a concavity that is present on the distal surface. The cingulum will be screw skewed and it will be turned in towards the distal portion. Finally, coming to the root, you have a single root and the root is the longest in the oral cavity. The root will gradually taper to a sharp margin. Yes, and you will sometimes see flattening of the mesial and distal side of the root. In cross section, the root is going to be roughly ovoid and a root canal will be seen in the center of the tooth. The midsection of the tooth is most likely going to be much more convex and it gradually tapers until it hits and reaches a smooth apex. Finally, we come to the variations in the teeth. We come to the variations in the teeth. The crown form does not usually vary much, but the sharpness of the cusp can vary from time to time. In the lingual area, we know that the lingual cingulum is going to be very hefty. Therefore, sometimes an additional accessory cusp can form over here and this is called a tubercle. Therefore, the cingulum will show a tubercle. Similarly, root length is also uh, privy to various uh, changes. The root length may be extremely long, the root length can be extremely short according to various conditions. But in some cases, the root length is so long that it may sometimes penetrate into the antrum of the maxillary sinus. Sometimes, if it is curved, you are going to see a deflection and this deflection will almost be towards the distal surface. The deflection of the root will be towards the distal surface and finally the canine is in a very special place it is called the cornerstone of the tooth sometimes the canine will not erupt there can be agenesis but a much more plausible explanation is that after the deciduous canine was lost the canine never even erupted the canine would still be stuck inside the oral cavity the canine is one of the most important impacted tooth in the maxillary segment so what are the things that we learnt in the maxillary canine you remember it is a diamond shaped pentagonal tooth which is asymmetrical in nature yes you have the first differentiation of the slopes the distolingual distolabial slope is much larger than the mesiolingual slope. A slight concavity was seen, a sharp apex was seen, a deflection of the root apex to the distal was seen. Uh, you saw a bulky cingulum, a prominent labial ridge, a prominent uh, middle uh, lobe which was there during development. You saw a mesiolingual and a mesio and a distolingual concavity in the lingual aspect. You saw a generalized convex surface of the canine and the contact points were extremely large and at the level of the junction of the incisal as well as the middle third. In the incisal aspect, you saw that the incisor had a concave, the, uh, the canine had a concavity that was lodged in the distal aspect, which made the entire cingulum shift towards the distal it was offset distally all of them engaged in the formation of a sharp cusp 
all these features together gave the canine its bulk and this is one of the most bulkiest teeth the longest root in the oral cavity and the most common uh, impaction after the molars uh, after the third molars in the oral cavity this is an entire overview of the canine uh, in the next class we shall be dealing with the mandibular canine thank you